Hello. Uh, I think good evening for most parts of the world at this point, uh, or good very early in the morning for others. But um, in any case, welcome. I'm very glad that you're here for our workshop on spatially resolved transcriptomics. Uh, we'll be sh starting shortly. Um, a few housekeeping items. So I think if you have questions for the speaker, we'll mostly hold those for the end, but if you run into a showstopper, I'll be monitoring the Q and A and we can um, pause and get you caught up to speed. I know Lucas said that there's gonna be an interactive component and we'll try to get you like, have everything installed for the interactive component which will come at the end of the session. Um, so, um, and then otherwise um, you can uh, raise your hand if you wanna be brought to the stage and we'll have a video of this posted shortly in case you have to leave. So without uh, further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Lucas Weber from Johns Hopkins, where he's currently a postdoc in the biostats department. I think I got that right, yeah? That's right. Uh, who will be presenting on uh, spatial transcript elements, which I'm very curious to see myself because I definitely need to brush up on this for a couple of data sets that have been sitting on my machine for uh, a month or two here, so. Take it away, Lucas. Great, okay, well, thanks a lot. Um, and thanks for having me and thanks for joining those who are here at all hours of the day. Um, so I'll just share my screen. Okay, now I'm gonna switch to a website. So we've got uh, two websites for this workshop. There's uh, one with, uh, the, the OSTA online book that we've developed, Orchestrating Spatially Resolved Transcriptomics Analysis with Bioconductor. That's at lmweber.org slash OSTA book, the compiled version. And then we've got the workshop web website, uh, OSTA Workshop Bioc 2021, which is also there in, in, uh, in my GitHub at lmweber.org. Now, before I go any further, um, I'll show the installation instructions. So if you do want to install something right now as I'm going, uh, uh, that will give a bit more time. So that's here. We've got instructions for both uh, devel version and release version of Bioconductor. So it's uh, the, the Docker image and the whole workshop has been compiled in devel, and that should work fine. If you have a release installation on your computer right now of 3.13, then we've got the instructions here to get the additional latest packages from GitHub that you need. Okay, so I just wanted to show that before I start. So yeah, so this is the, the page, um, the links to the rendered workshop and the source repo as well. So this workshop is about uh, our online book that we've been developing called Orchestrating Spatially Resolved Transectomics Analysis with Bioconductor, OSTA, which describes the steps in a computational analysis pipeline for spatially resolved transcriptomics data using Bioconductor. And some key points here to point out uh, are that OSTA is built around the spatial experiment object class, which you may have uh, heard about from our, our other workshop as well, and emphasizing throughout the Bioconductor principle of modularity that uh, you can substitute alternative packages for different steps if, if you wish to, and all built around this, this uh, standardized class. And a very important point there, which um, someone was asked about previously, is that OSTA methods are compatible with single cell experiment, the existing single cell structures. So all of the, that huge range of methods out there can be applied here as well to these structures. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and I mentioned there's a, there's a Docker image as well that has a, a current version of everything that should also work. It's quite a large download, but that's a, an alternative option to run it. And I uh, want to acknowledge a large group of people who've uh, helped here. This has been a huge joint effort. Abby Spangler and Madhavi Tipani at the Libre Institute for Brain Development and Leonardo Collado Torres at the Libre Institute, Stephanie Hicks uh, here at Johns Hopkins. That's on OSTA. And then for the spatial experiment structure, we've got Dario Rigelli, Helena Kroll, Aaron Lund, Stephanie Hicks, and W. Riso, uh, our core team there. Right. Now here, we've got a few different vignettes in this website. Uh, the first one has some introductory and background material on spatially resolved transit comics, and then links to more information in OSTA itself. So spatially resolved transcriptomics refers to 
new set of technological platforms that allows measuring trans transfectome-wide gene expression along with spatial resolution. In other words, the spatial coordinates of the measurements, such as on a tissue slide, depending on the platform. And there are several platforms for this. We are most familiar with the 10X Genomics Visium uh, platform, but there's also other ones, uh, SlideSeq, SeqFish Plus, Murfish. And we've got some examples here uh, showing like, yeah, what this data looks like. So you're measuring uh, transcriptome wide expression at, at spatial resolution. In the case of Visium, it's a grid of spots, uh, which is really cool. And I can see very powerful information that was previously just not available. And more links there in OSTA from additional information and also the introductory chapter in the spatial experiment workshop. Now, I mentioned the 10X Genomics Visium platform. Uh, we are particularly focused on that in our examples, but the methods and data structures are broadly applicable to both spot-based and molecule-based uh, platforms. 10X Genomics Visium is a spot-based platform that measures expression at a grid of around 5,000 spots on a small capture area of size six and a half by six and a half millimeters, uh, where uh, a, a fresh frozen tissue uh, tissue specimen is, is uh, placed on there. So you get uh, these measurements at a regular grid of spots, spots uh, all across all across the slide. And uh, the way the experiment actually works, you have four capture areas uh, next to each other uh, for four samples. And then the data structure that you get out of this is a, a matrix of, of uh, transfer counts per spot, um, similar to single cell data. It's got a, a quick schematic here, 5,000 spots, 20,000 genes. Uh, and then along with that, all of the spatial information. And so you'll see here that there's quite a bit of similarity there with single cell analyses. As an initial approximation, uh, you can consider a spot to be equivalent to a cell and then apply single cell methods. Of course, that's a, that's a very rough approximation, uh, especially depending on tissue density or the type of tissue that you're analyzing. Uh, but that gives a starting point for analysis methods. And as I mentioned before, that means that the huge set of existing methods from single cell uh, analyses can be directly applied to this data as well, subject to, to that approximation. And I've got a link there to the OSCAR book, uh, which is a huge and amazing resource for uh, single cell analysis pipelines. And that was the inspiration for OSTA, like a, a, a smaller version of this specifically for uh, spatial data. And yeah, so that leads us to the question, how best to analyze um, spatial result trans transcriptomics data. And our, our aim in OSTA is to show some uh, computational analysis pipelines built around uh, bioconductor methods. And in the future, as we see more and more develop, uh, more and more methods developed specifically for spatial data, and especially within the bioconductor framework, we will integrate these in additional workflow examples. Um, yeah, then more links to the chapters in, in Austin. Yeah. So that was a quick overview of the background. Then in the next section here, we've got additional background first on the data set that I'm going to use for the, the short example uh, in the later part of this workshop. So this is a 10X Genomics Museum uh, data set from human brain in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex region from our publication there, there's a link. Uh, the full data set contains 12 samples and for, this, for these examples, we've taken one of those samples and formatted that into a spatial experiment object, sample 151673. The full data set is also available from the spatial LIBD bioconductor package that Leonardo Coyote Torres has, has put together there. And there's a shiny web app to explore that further as well. Then now I'll go to the OSTA links. So in the first, and, and this, so the next few sections here on this vignette to link directly to these parts of, of OSTA. So in OSTA, this is, so this is what it looks like. That's the, the front page, the welcome, and the introductory material. I've got, uh, Lots of tabs open there just with all the different pages in case the connection just breaks right now, but I don't think that's happening. So there's some uh, introductory material, information on spatial result transcriptomics, 
and the spatial experiment structure, which I'll actually get to um, just after this. And then there's a section called uh, pre-processing steps. And these are the pre-processing steps that are required to load the raw data from a museum experiment into R for further downstream analysis. And then the, the later chapters are all the individual analysis steps. So the first chapter here, called image segmentation. And this is on image segmentation and cell counting. So here, uh, there's another schematic of the VCM platform and what this looks like. So these are, that's what the actual image looks like. The, the spots around the corner are used for uh, aligning the image. And then you've got the histology, histology image of the slide in the middle. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is six and a half by six and a half millimeters. Um, and there are, yeah, several steps required here. There's a tool called VistoSeg, which has uh, been led in development by Madhavi uh, Tipani at the Lib Institute, uh, which can be used for these initial steps. And there's, uh, yeah, there's four main steps that we've listed here. And uh, I should mention here, there's much more information at this link as well in the VistoSeg documentation. Uh, that one's not loading right now. Yeah, let's have some trouble with the connection before. Okay, but yeah, the link is there. So this is a MATLAB pipeline. The first step here is to split the image. I mentioned there are four uh, capture areas on the VCM slide, slide, and then splitting those into individual images. The second step is nuclei segmentation uh, to count uh, individual uh, cells. Then uh, we also need an input from Space Ranger, and finally, the uh, counting the cells and nuclei. And uh, some really nice images here showing how this works. This is a, an example of, of splitting that histology image into the four, four images. And then, as I mentioned, segmenting the cell nuclei and ident identifying the number of cells per spot. And that can be a crucial input for the downstream analyses, which is not an input that's uh, given by default by the 10x uh, software. So that's, uh, yeah, that's really powerful additional information that um, they can get from the VistoSeg uh, pipeline. And I should also also mention here, actually, there's a preprint on VistoSeg that's just gone up on BioArchive um, from Madhavi Tipani. So you can um, see more information there as well. Then the second very important uh, pre-processing step is going through loop browser and space ranger. So these are the, the softwares provided by 10x genomics for processing the, the raw data. Loop browser is a graphical interface that can be used to align the images. So uh, you know where the spots are uh, and align the, the reads to the, to the spots. And this can be done in both manual and automatic ways. And here, um, Abby Spangler and Leah Carter Torres have put together a nice uh, detailed example showing how to how to step through these procedures to uh, align the data um, and, and get this get this input. And then this um, is one of the inputs to this to the Space Ranger software for the actual uh, read alignment. The loop browser also lets you do some interactive uh, exploratory analysis of the data. More examples here. <clears throat> then the Space Ranger chapter. So Space Ranger, this is the, the software, uh, the processing pipeline from 10 Genomics. Space, Space Ranger count is the part that does the read alignment. Uh, again, a uh, nice detailed example here showing how to how to step through all this. Um, and at the end of this, this gives you a a standard set of uh, files that can be used to load the data into, into R. And we've included a helper function as well within the spatial experiment package to, to read that standard data structure in. There's uh, also a web summary HTML file that can be used to uh, do some further QC as a quick overview of the data. And then again here, linking to VistoSeg for quantifying the number of cells per spot. Uh, if, if that input is also available. Right. So then 
And I'll just quickly go back to the workshop page. So this was um, the data set and pre-processing part. Then I, and then the last part here is the, the spatial experiment structures itself. So after running, after running loop browser and space ranger, load the data into, uh, into a spatial experiment object. And this uh, image here uh, gives an illustration of how that is structured. I won't spend much more time on that. We had a separate workshop on spatial experiment itself. Essentially, it's extending the single, single cell experiment structure uh, for spatial data with additional structures in there to store the, the spatial coordinates and spatial metadata and, and image information. Okay, so then um, the third chapter here is an analysis workflow from OSTA. So I'll go back to the OSTA book itself for this. So here in the, in the workshop page, there's a, a short version of this analysis workflow. So if you're working from Docker, uh, it's, all, it's all here as well and should work. And the longer, longer version is in OSTA itself, but either, either way should work if you're following along. So here, now, yeah, this is now chapter analysis steps. So it's structured as there's a part on introduction, part on pre-processing, then a part on analysis steps. And finally, at the end, some longer workflow chapters, which uh, have complete workflows with uh, less detail than in the previous analysis chapters. So it's like a complete workflow in one place. And finally, appendix. So here in analysis steps, um, the first thing to do here is to load the data set in. So to do this, I'll get our studio open over here and have these two side by side. So I've already typed this in here. So if you load spatial experiment, then a second package that we've developed called ST example data, which has some pre-formatted uh, objects in it. And then depending on which version you're using, 3.13 or 3.14, we've got the instructions here on the left for how to load it. In, in DEVEL, you can use the uh, accessor function from experiment hub, which looks like that, uh, vcm underscore human dlpfc as a function. If you're working from the GitHub version in release, then you have to use this helper function called load data, which is the one that I've actually used here in, in my installation right now. So then we can have a look at this object. And as I mentioned, this is one sample of, of human brain from this in platform. So we've called it SPE. Spatial experiment. Um, and yeah, if you're familiar with single cell experiment, you'll see that that looks quite similar, but has several additional pieces attached. So we can uh, look at the size of it. So 33,000 rows, uh, 5,000 columns, that's the, the features and the, the spots. Um, if we look at row data, that's the information about the, the genes, call data, information about the spots and there in this object we've got the cell count as well counts uh, per, per spot we've also got a column ground truth from from an original publication and sample id and then the actual counts are stored in the, the assay called counts and uh spatial data has the additional spatial metadata a crucial one here is called in tissue that identifies whether the spot is over tissue or not. And the spatial chords has the uh, X, Y coordinates of the, of the spots. And yeah, some more details on that uh, was covered in the, the spatial experiment workshop. And image data that's the image information and images. Okay, so now I'll move this over a little bit. So the next step then is quality control. Now, 
this quality control chapter has uh, quite a lot of detail on how to do the quality control at spot level to uh, filter out low quality spots. I think what I'll do is I'll do the short version of this so we don't spend the rest of the workshop just on quality control. Now the short version is in the workflow chapter at the end or also in the, if you're on the, the vignette three from the workshop materials, uh, that's also the short version. But here in the VCM Human Deal PFC workflow chapter at the end. So this is the same as the parts above, but just condensed. So I'll go through the quality control part from here. So the first thing we do is have a look at the data. It's always good to do. We've got a package called GG Sparviz, which is also in the installation instructions that uh, has some uh, plotting functions. One of these is called plot spots. And we can use that just to get a quick check um, that the data is loaded and that the orientation is as we expect. And that is what we look, what we expect from the histology image. So that's good. So this is showing just the spots that are over tissue, identified with that in tissue column. Then, yeah, then quality control. So first, uh, to make things a bit faster and simpler, we uh, subset just the spots over tissue, Oops. Uh, which we can do by getting the spatial data um, in tissue column equal one equals to one, and that will subset the object. Now we've got 3,639 um, spots. I think before this, it was 4,992. And now we can calculate spot level quality control metrics using Skater, which is a package for single cell analysis. And then that stores the, the metrics in cold data, similar to, to single cell data. So load Skater. First, we identify mitochondrial genes. Um, so we need that later. So 13 mitochondrial genes. And here, checking that we've actually got the right ones. And then we can calculate the per cell QC, so per, per cell QC function, which is now applied at spot level. And if that's worked correctly, that's stored all of these um, QC metrics in the cold data calculated at spot level. And then we can uh, select filtering thresholds. And in the um, in the longer QC chapter, I've got several examples showing how to, how to select those. Here, we've got a short version. So we'll plot uh, various histograms of them. Oops, oh. okay, uh, because I've got the RStudio window uh, tiny. It's uh, not letting me do it there. Um, that's okay. It's over here in the in the material here as well. So yeah, uh, I've got the histograms of these metrics. Let's reset my footing window. And then based on those histograms and the longer version, doing that uh, sort of carefully and interactively is, is in the other chapter. We select uh, thresholds for each of those QC metrics. And I'll just paste them all in. So one on the library size, one on the number of detected genes per spot, uh, one on mitochondrial percentage, and one on uh, cell count, which we have in this data set, but which is, uh, which may not be available depending on the data set that you're working with. And then we can look at the number of discarded spots that we've got according to these metrics. So I went through that quite quickly, but as I mentioned, there's more detail in the longer chip. And combining them, that's telling us that we're discarding 57 spots. Storing that back in the object. And now we can use the plotting function to confirm that we haven't done something that doesn't make sense. 
uh, or that's uh, losing uh, important biological information. So here on this plot, I've um, plotted the, the discarded spots in red. So we can check that they're not obviously correlated with some biological um, features of, of interest. Like if, if um, so given that we're looking for cortical layers in this, in this data set, if all of the discarded spots were clearly in one cortical layer, then we'd have a problem. We'd need to go back and check that we've uh, picked those thresholds in a way that makes sense. So this is a good, a good check to make sure that the, we're not throwing away information that we were not, not expecting to throw away. Okay, so that's quality control. Then uh, next is normalization. And for this, I'll go back to the main chapters. And you'll see in these chapters, so always at the top, there's the code to rerun things up to that point. Like if you're interested just in feature selection, you can go to the feature selection chapter, rerun the block of code at the top and start from there. So here we can again now do uh, log transformation and normalization using methods from single cell analyses using the SCRAN package. Load scan. Then we do quick clustering with uh, pool based size factors. Uh, there's much more detail on that in the Oscar book if, if you want to um, see more about that. This one takes a few seconds, um, so I'll just let that run for a bit. Still going. Okay, good. And then compute some factors, size factors, and store those back in the object. And this is this is the same as with a, with a single cell object. Then usually we look at the, a histogram of these as well to check. And finally, getting the log transformed normalized counts that we use for, for the downstream analysis. And we can check that they're stored correctly in the object with assay names. So now we've got uh, two matrices in there, counts and log counts, which has the log transform normalized counts. Um, and here, I think I just had a double check that the dimensions still made sense. Yeah. Okay. And as I mentioned, yeah, so much more information on that in the in the other in the Oscar book that we're using single cell methods here. And now that we've got uh, log transform normalized counts, we can go to feature selection, dimensionality reduction, and clustering. So in feature selection, here we look for uh, interesting genes. Highly. So here in this version of, uh, of this part, we've got the methods uh, for highly variable genes um, developed for single cell data. There's been um, some really interesting work published just very recently on, on spatially variable genes as well, which now scales to, to VCM data as well. Um, that's not available in Bioconductor yet, but yeah, in the future we expect there will be uh, methods here for, for spatially variable genes in addition to have highly variable genes. Uh, right now we're using the highly variable genes methods uh, from SCRAN. So first we, uh, here we here we actually remove those mitochondrial genes as well because they tend to um, be ranked at the top and are generally not the ones that we're interested in for this type of, of analysis with clustering cell types, for example. Um, that's a, that's a, that depends on the, the type of analysis you're doing there. So here I'm removing that and checking. So now there's uh, 13 less rows taken out the mitochondrial genes. Um, library scan, I think I loaded that already before. Then 
fit the main variance relationship. And check it with a plot. And then selecting the top highly variable genes uh, using, in this case, the standard methods from single cell. We've got 1,414 highly variable genes here. Okay. And now that we've got um, those uh, ranked highly variable genes, we can use them for dimensionality reduction and clustering. So here we've got code for uh, doing PCA, principal component analysis, using, uh, again, the, the fast methods now from a skater. And that has a, a random seed as well. This one takes a few seconds as well. This will be stored in the redu reduced DIMS slot, uh, same as for a single cell data. So we can check that that really is there by um, doing reduced DIM names of the object. And we can see now we've got the PCA in there. And checking the dimensions of that should be 50 PCs that we ask for. That's the default. Yep, so 3,639 spots and 50 top PCs. And then we can also calculate uh, UMAP dimensions on those top 50 PCs, and that's used for visualization. So this should only have two um, dimensions, yeah. I think here, uh, yeah, this is for plotting. So I usually give them column names, UMAP1, UMAP2. That makes the, the plotting a bit simpler. And then here we've got plotting functions. However, I'll show these in the next part because there we also have some um, annotation for them. And that's the clustering part. Yeah, so yeah, now clustering, which is um, my favorite part. Uh, so yeah, now here we're doing graph-based clustering uh, from uh, from Scran and Skater again. Just let that go. I think, that, oh yeah, that's actually really quick. Yeah, so yeah, we've um, got a few settings there that we're telling out and also setting a random seed for reproducibility and then doing graph based uh, clustering with the walk trap uh, method using those uh, PCA dimensions that we calculated in the, in the previous step. And we can store those cluster labels back in the object as a factor. That's uh, also a method from the single cell pipelines. And now um, the bit that I just skipped in the dimensionality reduction for the plots, here we can um, make various plots of the reduced dimensions and of and of the clusters in, in x, y coordinates. So loading that plotting package again, GT Sparvis. Um, so yeah, we can plot the clusters either in X, Y coordinates or in reduced dimension coordinates. This first bit here, plot spots uh, with annotation. This plots them in the X, Y coordinates. So that's the clustering on the, on the molecular dimensions in X, Y coordinates. And in this data set, we have a ground truth uh, from manual annotation uh, from, from that paper, which we can use to compare the clustering. And so these were the, the cortical layers that we're looking for. Black is the white matter, and the others are the individual cortical layers. And you can see that the, the clustering has kind of reproduced that, but uh, definitely not perfectly. Um, and that's... Uh, uh, a research question of interest, how to, how to improve that. And there's been some uh, very nice uh, methods to, to cluster that better in, 
in the, in the, in the spatial space as well. So here in this example, we're just using the molecular information to show that as a, as a baseline. Um, and then if we want to show that in the reduced dimension space, we've got a different function here called plot dim red. That was also on the previous page with the dimension reduction. Um, yeah, that's showing it in PCA space, or if we're showing it in uh, UMAP space, it's this one. And there's another function um, that's not here, uh, which we did show in the spatial experiment workshop. And uh, it's called uh, plot visium, which has uh, a lot more options as well for plotting on the visium slide. And yeah, so now in the future here, uh, we'll uh, continue to uh, expand this with methods that have been developed more recently for the, the spatial context. Um, and now, uh, then the next chapter is on marker gene testing. I think I'll I'll leave that in the interests of time. Uh, but there's, yeah, there's more information here as well. So that's um, that's basically going through a going through a, a single cell analysis pi pipeline for the Visium data. Uh, and yeah, the complete version here is in this uh, chapter called Human DLPFC Workflow. We've also got additional workflow chapters here at then at the end. Um, yeah. And I think I'll go back to the workshop page. So just to say again, so yeah, here we had the, the initial work, workshop page with the links and installations and uh, instructions, um, the Docker image, then these three articles, introduction, the data set pre-processing, and this workflow chapter. So this was um, basically what I went through just now in the interactive example. Um, and yeah, the longer version of that in OSTA itself. And uh, and yes, of course, the, the pre-processing chapters that I started with. And the spatial uh, experiment here. So yeah, this has this image as well. So this, uh, yeah, this is the structure that we're trying to build all of this around to, to ensure compatibility. So uh, it's easy then to substitute alternative methods. I think I'll stop sharing my screen now so we can leave some time for questions. Great. Yeah, it looks like we've got a few questions here. Great. So uh, we've got looks like our first question uh, involving question about integrative analysis here. Yeah. So do you have plans to include? Yeah. 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 Right. So yeah, multi-sample data sets. Um, at some point, yes, uh, definitely. Uh, and as methods are developed for that type of analysis, um, yes, we would go in that direction as well. Uh, I think for now, it's just uh, the individual samples in the workflows that we have. Yeah. I guess as a follow-up to that, have you seen a lot of um, batch issues looking slide to slide? Like, does each slide kind of have its own uh, clusters or are there more label sharing? I, I don't have a Great answer. Just um, yeah, I mean yes, that's always going to be an issue. Uh, I think that yeah, checking that systematically is, is going to be uh, something that yeah it needs to be done. Um, yeah. Um, I had a, a question that uh, I guess we have a comment in the chat here saying that uh, Edward Zhao says that in their oh, yeah. experience, yes, on the batch effect. I mean that's true throughout single cell. Um, yeah. Projects, I think it has gone a little bit better with kind of the vanilla 10x droplet technology, but it still is definitely an issue. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so you mentioned like new algorithms under development for variable gene selection that are instead going to look for genes that are spatially variable rather than just like over dispersion 
how much modification do you think other methods that are sort of tried and tested from single cell RNA-seq are going to need to handle the correlation of spatial data? Because there yeah, are so I, developments still necessary with that. So I, there have been some um, publications just very recently on, on methods for spatially variable genes that do scale to this kind of data size. Um, so I think here for OSTA, we want to make sure that that's available within the bioconductor framework and and has been uh, tested and, and compared against uh, other methods, uh, ideally. So I think, yeah, I think it's, we, we, we would like to integrate that, but we, we want to make sure it's available within the bioconductor framework. Yeah. yeah. Are you seeing like lots of method development happening in um, some of the dimension reduction methods? Because you can imagine that like PCA, uh, if you want to think of it a, as a probabilistic model is assuming independence amongst observations. And we know that spatially things that are closer together in space are going to be more alike than things that are distant, which is sort of a, turns the PCA, at least this probabilistic interpretation of PCA on its head. So you, have you seen work even in sort of basic things like that? I, I, I have seen work, but yeah, I can't um, think of, something right now but yes I, I mean that's a, a very active um, topic that people are thinking about and I think yes we'll we'll see I mean uh, a, a big issue here is going to be scalability like there are um, very nice methods like that but if it doesn't scale to tens of thousands of spots then that's really hard to integrate into our pipelines we saw that with the earlier um, spatially variable genes methods such as spatial DE and uh, that, that just didn't scale to this this size, but now there have been more recent methods that, that do. So, um, yeah, I mean, from, from the OSTA perspective, we want to make sure that it's scalable and integratable into the pipelines. Yeah, yeah I think the scalability is a very important concern because if it takes days to run, uh, unless it really does something truly revolutionary, sure. no one is going to be able to use it. So. Exactly. Yeah, like if it's just ranking um, the top genes, then yeah, it has to be fast. And yeah, there, there are methods now. Yeah. Um, it looks like we've got uh, another question here from uh, Patipa. Yeah, so are the QC methods subject specific? I'd say with QC, um, yeah, so every data set's going to be a bit different. So there it's, it's crucial to do this interactively and really looking at the data. That's why in, in the QC chapter there, I've got uh, several yeah, plotting examples, just yeah, really looking at the data and that, that, that you're not just using some standard threshold and then, and then filtering out half of the, the information that you needed. Yeah. Yeah, I've certainly observed that uh, buyer beware of like automated QC because you might end up throwing out all of some cell type that you're interested in, like exactly. cells are like very low complexity, and you don't want to just like gate on things that don't have very many genes expressed because you'll be getting rid of a bunch of plasma cells. Yeah. Um, well, I think this we're about at the end of our session here. Um, so unless there are any further questions, let's thank Lucas again for the great presentation, and uh, I. Imagine you may like it or not have lots of questions directed to you via uh, GitHub or Slack or how, how should people get in touch with you if they've got questions? Yeah, uh, so GitHub issues uh, is, is always a great way and we're on, we're on Slack as well, yeah. Fantastic. All right, well, um, thanks a lot, everyone. And uh, I guess if you're, we'll, you're going to stick around for the last session, uh, thanks and we'll maybe see you on that. Right. Thanks.